So for those who don't know, my name is John Mack. I'm the artist behind this exhibition, A Species Between Worlds, Our Nature, Our Screens. I also am uh, the designer of this forum that's been going on for the month of September. And I'm also the founder of a nonprofit that I began this year called Life Calling, which works to preserve our humanity in the digital age. Tonight, I am welcoming uh, Richard Garriott. And I spoke to Richard yesterday and I said, do you have any text that you want me to use to introduce you? And he said, no, just tell him I'm Richard Garriott. So Richard Garriott is here. <laughs> but that's not good enough for me. So I do have to talk a little bit about him, not for him, but for me. So I wrote a poetry book, uh, actually, which goes alongside this exhibition. So I've traveled to over 50 US national parks and each park has a poem that goes with it. And I investigated the history of the park, what's going on in the park, the wildlife in the park, and I tried to find things in the park that ran analogous to human behavior. So when you're reading these poems, it's almost like, what can we learn about the park that also teaches us about ourself and our nature? And one of my biggest impediments before publishing this was who was going to write the foreword. And I actually think it was Richard Weiss, who's here in the audience right now, who said, you gotta meet this guy, Richard Garriott. And I said, okay, well, tell me about him. He has been to the North Pole, the South Pole, the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest point in the ocean, and the International Space Station. And beyond that, the thing that really resonated with me is he's a gamer. He was the pioneer gamer in the gaming world back in the day. And he actually gave the word, well, the Sanskrit word that already existed, he applied that to gaming. So anytime you hear someone say, look at the avatar in the game, that word avatar in gaming comes from Richard Garriott. And um, I just wanna read something here. This is from, uh, so avatar in Sanskrit, is it pronounced avatara? Is it? Okay. Um, is a concept within Hinduism that in Sanskrit literally means descent. It signifies the material appearance or incarnation of a powerful deity, goddess, or spirit on earth. Now the reason I bring this up is because if you imagine that we've got one descent, which is the godlike essence creature into physical form on earth, now we've got this other avatar, which is this manifestation within the digital space. And the reason I bring this up is because what was just gaming back in the day, we're now moving into the metaverse. And we will become avatars in the metaverse. And I just wanna throw out this one question before I bring Richard up to the stage, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit afterwards. Are we witnessing right now a second fall of man into a digital realm? So I'll just float that out there. And I'd like to welcome uh, my friend Richard Garrett. Well, good evening, everyone. And I, I see a lot of friends in the audience, which is a, which is a nice thing to speak amongst uh, people who you think won't throw tomatoes as often as others. Uh, or maybe they will. Uh, but, but also to speak to a lot of you, because I, in the audience, I see people from my gaming uh, friends and communities uh, for, uh, for decades. I see others, uh, what more from our gaming <laughs> realities uh, for decades. Uh, as well, a lot of you I know are members of the Explorers Club that I've been exploring with for decades. Uh, and, and what we're going to be talking about today is the intersection, the combining of these, these worlds together. So it's a, 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 I think an, an interesting time. And, uh, and I got to say also, thank you, John, wherever you ran off to. Uh, th thank you, John. You, you know, when, we, when you first, when Richard Weiss introduced us and you first told me about the book and the idea for this exhibit, I was over the moon. I was like going, I have to find a way to be a part of this. I, it, the, I thought the, the broad concept was brilliant. And I knew that while I was approaching it from sort of the opposite end, so you know, of the, that, that we would meet, we have a meeting of the minds somewhere in the middle, uh, which I think has borne out through this whole, the whole project. So I was very excited to be part of it. And so thank you for, for dragging me in. Uh, 
But to get started, you know, as John noted, and I have some notices on the front of my, my laptop here, uh, uh, I have my, my little self-aggrandizement, uh, you know, as my little my explorer claim to fame, is I happen to, at least at this moment, be the only explorer who happens to have been from the North Pole to the South Pole and the bottom of the Mariana Trench and have, have orbited the, the, the Earth in space. And by the way, I did all of those things through connections and organizations and activities we organized at the Explorers Club. So by the way, if you want to go do all this cool stuff, join the Explorers Club if you're not already a member. Uh, but I happen to simultaneously have had this career going in video games. In fact, the only video game that really predates me was Pong. In fact, uh, you know, I remember at home when we had the old console television with antennas that you had to arrange and the circular one for UHF and we would clip the little alligator clips for the Pong device on the television and play Pong. And immediately after that, I began to discover that these were not only these video game consoles, but they were computers. And I began to, you can see over here on the left, I began my, my first games were written on spools of paper tape and punch cards before even personal computers existed. And then as soon as personal computers existed, I migrated them to personal computers and also began to sell them. And they started making money, and in fact, some pretty good money. In fact, that first little game in a little Ziploc bag that my mother helped me make that we sold on the corner store of the computer land where I grew up, that made more money in three months than my dad made in a year as an astronaut. And, um, uh, and it got better after that. Uh, and I actually forgot to mention uh, that you know, my, my father, I've now noted, was an astronaut. He flew twice into space on Skylab and the shuttle. And my mother was an, astro uh, was a, an artist and a naturalist and really introduced me to all different forms of art, including taxidermy that I put up in my Explorers Club office against the rules, uh, and, uh, uh, and a wide variety of other kinds of art. And I think of the quintessential high-tech art is video games. And so I was you know, the right age at the right time, the right parental background to really get a, a running start, you might say, in, in making video games. But I'm gonna actually start today's discussion in exploration instead of video games. I'll come back to video games afterwards. You know, I think most of you know this, that you know, exploration has always been a part of the human existence from the beginning of the evolution of our species uh, you know, uh, quite some time ago. And, and we were explorers to both solve problems, but also to find better opportunities. So, you know, you'd either flee the dangers of temperature or animals and look for, you know, more, you know, greener pastures, uh, metaphorically. And, and while it took humanity four billion years to evolve out of the primordial goo, it only took about 300,000 years for humans to spread on every continent of the planet except Antarctica. And, but what's interesting about that is it took 300,000 years to get a few million people on the earth, well, well below a billion people after 300,000 years of, of humans spreading out. But only in the last 200 years, 200 years, that's like as, only as long as this country has existed, we've gone from under a billion people on the planet to over eight billion people on the planet. And if you look at that hockey stick, that is a pretty scary hockey stick. And it's actually interesting that, that you know, any of us can go look up data about you know, you know, fresh water, or energy, all kinds of natural resources. We have a real problem showing up in front of us on everything, you know, extinction of species, all these other kinds of problems that are, that, are, that are coming to a head very soon if we don't do something about it. And I would argue that that's why the world more than ever needs explorers out there doing the work of exploration. You know, we have to catalog the natural world. We have to understand the role of each and every part of the natural world. We have to know what we ought, what, what's it really important to, to protect. And if we're gonna lose 100 but only can save one, what's the one we better save? And we have to share the knowledge, all that kind of knowledge publicly, and we have to plan solutions to that. And, you know, very fortunately, I happen to right now be a member of the same club that uh, you know, a good number of you are a member of, the Explorers Club. And, uh, uh, and for those of you who are not Explorers Club members, to tell you a little bit about that, you know, it was founded 120 years ago, so not, not the full 200, but, but pretty far back uh, in what uh, I like to call the, the, the heroic age of exploration, you know, where people were risking and often losing life and limb in the pursuit of reaching the most extreme parts of the earth, the poles, uh, the top of Everest, the bottom of the ocean, uh, the surface of the moon. Uh, 
And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, we, we call these our, our famous firsts. In fact, while the people who made it to those farthest reaches often carried national flags of different countries, they all carried the Explorers Club flag. And so uh, uh, we, we, we celebrate these actually in the, in the entryway of the, of the Explorers Club if you get a chance to come there. If you haven't, uh, come check it out. You're welcome. But I actually think we, right now we live in a new golden age of exploration. And this golden age of exploration is brought about by the same exponential technologies that are driving a lot of the things that John's talking about in, the, in, in this exhibition. But these exponential technologies, which aren't just digital, it's also material science and all kinds of other areas, it's opening and expanding opportunities for exploration. It's opening new ways to explore land, air, sea, and space, but also not just the macroscopic things, but the microscopic things like DNA. You know, we're, we're now able to do work in, in the microscopic in ways we've, we never have before. Uh, and just as some examples, we, one of our Explorers Club medalists, Victor Vescovo, who was actually at the club lecturing just a couple days ago, built this submarine, which is the first submarine ever to exist that can make repeated full ocean dive depths to the bottom of every point, including the deepest point, the Mariana Trench, which is how I got to go, uh, uh, for the first time. And so the bottom 85% of the oceans, which you've, I'm sure you've all heard those things where, you know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of our ocean, which was, still is true but we now at least have a machine that can help start to rectify that problem. And, and I'm sure by now you've all seen some of the SpaceX boosters they're using to put up. You know, they launch a new uh, Falcon 9 launch uh, every six and a half days right now is their cadence for this last year. But that rocket is only partially reusable. The booster comes back, but the second stage does not. And the capsule some, is partially reusable. But they're about to launch, before the end of this year, hopefully, this new vehicle called Starship, which is truly 100% reusable. And the importance of that is that it's going to drive costs down compared to when I flew myself to space 12, 14 years ago, uh, where a, a flight costs tens of millions of dollars per person weight, uh, to where this vehicle will bring the price down by more than 1,000. And so we think it will literally be a few tens of thousands to go to space with this per person weight uh, compared to tens of millions. And so uh, it's a true game changer that is gonna really unlock a lot of activity, not just exploration, but, uh, but exploitation, uh, including resource gathering, importantly, from space. And, <clears throat> and of course, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned um, the uh, going into the, the microscopic as well, uh, where this is a, a company I happen to be a big fan of called Basecamp Research that takes around, if you look in that little yellow oval, that's a shirt pocket sized complete gene sequencer that instead of, you know, I used to go on expeditions where we'd spend a, a whole team of us would go out for most of a month to bring back one sample, get one strand of DNA. And they're now out there with this device, every square meter around an unusual chemi uh, chemistry area canvassing every square meter what all the different kinds of life forms that, that exist in that single spot. Then, um, um, that's all what's happening right now. You know, if you look in the not very distant future, we're gonna be doing things like asteroid mining, and with asteroid mining, you're gonna be, by, you know, well, right now we've mined all the rare earth metals off the surface of the earth, they're easy to reach, and we're beginning to poison a lot of landscapes in order even to make the electric batteries for our electric cars. But a lot of this stuff is now freely abundant in space. And with these dramatically reduced prices, this is now all you know, coming, coming soon, shall we say. Similarly, there's another one of our partner companies, the Explorers Club, is a, a company that's literally bringing back the woolly mammoth and a variety of other extinct species. And, and not only can they now bring back extinct species, but that same technology, of course, means we can protect the loss of species that are almost extinct. It's even easier uh, to save them before they go, to, before they go away. And the real reason I'm, I kind of wanted to take you all through that as the exploring side first is because reality is awesome. The real world we live in is literally as, you know, the, the definition of the word awesome. It creates awe and wonder to get out into the real world and see it. And it's also, of course, important. I mean, not only our, our lives literally depend upon it, not only for food, but our, all of our medicine, and, uh, and even to stabilize the climate. Everything about 
the reality that we live in you know, is awesome and important. And the reason we as explorers go out into the world is to frankly, even, even if we're talking about, and I'm a big believer in you know, settling in space and moving out beyond the earth, but it's really to protect the earth. It's to protect this one very special uh, planet that we have. Uh, and, but there's been this interesting thing that's happened on the same journey, uh, that as we, as we grow and expand going outward, there's this interesting change in society that, ha- that, that isn't always for the better. And, and I'm gonna go back the same 200 years where we have gone from the under a billion people to now about eight billion people. And if you, previous to 200 years, all lifestyles were to a large degree rural lifestyles. And a rural, in a rural lifestyle, it means that your next door neighbors are generally your friends. You often have a common work background, you know, the factory that's nearby or the farms that are nearby. Your problems and lives rise and fall together if there's a drought or, a, or whatever, you know, might be the challenges to life. You, you're bonded together very tightly as a physical, physically close community. You know, if you, if you wanted to proverbially borrow a cup of sugar, you literally knew your neighbor and it was no big deal that that metaphor was true. You did go borrow a cup of sugar from the neighbor. When you went to go play games, there weren't video games, so you'd go next door and you'd play bridge or canasta or whatever you might play with your neighbors because you knew all of your neighbors. But that all began to change again about 200 years ago. And in fact, it started largely right here in New York. In fact, one of the first subway lines was the line to go from Brooklyn Heights down into Manhattan. uh, And with the construction of that subway line, commuting lifestyle began. And with commuting lifestyle, it had an interesting side effect. And that side effect is that your neighbors are no longer bonded to you in the way they were. Your neighbors are now strangers. You probably work at different kinds of, of businesses. Your, your fortunes in life rise and fall at different rates for different reasons. You don't have that commonality. You probably don't go borrow a cup of sugar. In fact, you know, a lot of people have written things like this. Your neighbors are these strangers who just happen to live next door. You know, and I think that was, that's largely true. But, but there's another interesting thing at play here before I roll into the role digital plays, <clears throat> which is I'd, I'd like to point out that you know, humans are social creatures. We want to do things with others. And I find going to the movies to be a really interesting example because when you go to the movies, you're not really doing something with the person next to you. You're both staring at the screen, largely ignoring each other. You might be you know, sharing a box of popcorn maybe, but mostly you talk before or after. The actual movie watching itself is something that is done, you know, psychologically separated in some sense of the word. And what's interesting about digital realities, virtual realities, online environments, is it actually brings people together that are perhaps physically distant from each other, but they're not actually doing something together. They're actually either communicating on a subject directly that they both care about, or in the case of a game, they're actually doing a challenging task together. And while while this commuting lifestyle has separated us from like-minded people, online communities bring the weirdest groups back together. For example, these are four real web areas that exist that I happen to find to, when we're putting to these slides, but like there is online communities for meeting prison inmates. There are online communities for looking at pictures of men with long hair. You know, there are online communities to get together and prepare for the zombie apocalypse, for real. And, uh, and there are online communities where if you wanna talk about how well prepared we are to you know, go meet God in heaven, there's people that actually just compare notes on you know, how well prepared they are. And, and of course, uh, what some of us in here have, have met through is online gaming. And uh, uh, yes, exactly. So, but for, for those who don't know, uh, John mentioned the word avatar, which comes from an earlier game, one of my games, Ultima Four: Quest of the Avatar. Uh, but the word MMO, massively multiplayer online games, MMO RPGs, uh, comes from this game, Ultima Online, which was really the first of its kind to bring millions of people simultaneously together into a, a virtual world. And when people play together online, an interesting thing happens, which is unlike the movies, you're really taking on challenges, right? You're conquering the monster or you're solving problems. You're, you're having absolutely positively real experiences. 
they deeply mean something to you as a person. Just like seeing a movie together, you're going like, I'm glad I went with a friend. If you play a game online, I would say you're even more glad you went with a friend because you really have worked together to solve the problem. And so when people live together and work together and solve problems together over a long span of time, it's no surprise that this plays an important role in their real life. And so for example, it was un unexpected at first until you begin to think about it that a lot of long-term permanent relationships are made online. And, uh, and so literally, I have personally officiated weddings in the game. I have personally officiated weddings between players in the real world. And I have personally officiated weddings in microgravity on a zero-g flight of people who play the games. And so, but these are real bonds. And so you, sh you cannot diminish the bonds that people make while playing in these virtual worlds. And simultaneously, when a game world goes on, in fact, Ultima Online had its 25th anniversary this week, so it's a hooray for you know, 25 years. And uh, also makes it the longest running game in history, just because it was the first uh, of its type. But, uh, but also, of course, in 25 years, a lot of people in the game, they're real, the, the real person in the real world has died. And when that first began to happen, people would just disappear out of the virtual world. And a lot of people would go like, oh, Bob quit showing up. Well, where's Bob? And most people didn't even know who Bob really was, much less where they lived, much less how to get in touch with them. And then suddenly, when they figured out that Bob had died, suddenly the online community was where their real friends were profoundly sad. And they were going like, how do we express this sadness? And they began to lobby us, the game creators, to help us make a memorial in the game to that lost soul. And over time, we began to give the community their own tools to be able to do that sort of thing. But the point is, this just is to go to tell you how deep and real these online emotions are between people. And beyond that, you know, there's other benefits of playing games online. You know, it, 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 there are pl there's plenty of science to back up that gaming online improves your concentration, your analytical skills, your communication skills, it lifts people's moods generally, uh, it enhances your social connections, you get faster reactions with your thumbs, uh, you learn a variety of new problem solving skills. And so uh, gaming can be, in its best, extremely beneficial. However, when you bring people, people when they gather, people have problems, people have social problems with each other. And so when you bring a lot of people into an online world, they bring their social problems with them. And so whether it's behaviors such as sexist behavior, um, which unlike the real world where the police might whack you on the head if you do something inappropriate in an online world, you can probably get away with it easier and you're more anonymous. And so it tends to bring out worse behavior since there's, it's harder to control or socially uh, quash that behavior, and so in many ways it's ripe for bad behavior to manifest. And I myself was really shocked early in the days of MMOs when I happened to be, in this case, I was in Korea, and I was going to what's called a PC bang, a big, you know, a big uh, a gaming room where they might have a hundred machines set up for people to play online games, and sometimes they're playing my game, sometimes playing this other game called Lineage, which was really popular at the time. And I'd walk over to like this group of 10 kids all furiously working together as a team and I'd go like, oh cool, you guys are, looks like you're really, you know, doing great as a team, what are you guys doing? And their answer was, we're killing the Japanese. And I'm going like, what? And they're going like, well, we, we hate Japanese people, we are killing the Japanese that we find in the game. And I was like, I was really taken aback and I then had to go like unpeel the layers of the onion to find out that in fact, they really were really angry with the Japanese over the you know, vestiges still associated with World War II. And so there was nothing like better than literally going out as a pack and hunting people of Japanese origin that happened to be communicating in Japanese. And so I was like, wow, I had no idea the levels of, uh, of real world issues that, that pour in, into these games. But there's another problem I think that uh, most of you might have felt, if not for yourself, at least for your children, which is, you know, how much is too much? And, you know, I, for one, have pointed that about myself. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up on my phone here. I think I can pull it up here quickly. Uh, screen time. So my daily average at this exact moment is actually down to only four hours and 40 minutes, about five hours of online time on an average daily. 
it has been as high as eight. And when I saw it as high as eight, I thought, wow, I must be a really horrible person to be spending eight hours in front of my screen. That's a full work day. But then you go actually look at the data, and it turns out I am completely average. In fact, at the moment, I'm well below average. At my five hours, the actual average is about eight hours. And so uh, it, is, it is stunning the amount of time that all of us, this is not just me, not just your kids, all of us are spending in front of our digital devices. And that brings us up to John. And so this is sort of when John and I you know, began to talk. So the rest of this is sort of noodling that is, has come out of the, the time that, that uh, uh, John and I have spent together. And, and, and by the way, how many of you have been through the exhibit, by the way, now? I, mean, I expect some of you are only here for, to come here tonight. Okay, so there's plenty that have not. And so, uh, by the way, you need to go through this exhibit and see it in order as John intended. Uh, I think the journey that you will go on will be z very enlightening and self-relevatory uh, in addition to uh, a, a good fun. And so uh, do take the time. But, you know, when he began to talk to me about how much, how he was worried about how much, you know, time, you know, people have spent, you know, checking out of reality and instead looking down at their phones, especially while playing Pokemon Go, you know, in national parks and things, as you see around on a lot of these pictures, you know, I was going like, look, you know, here's Biscayne Bay National Park, but, you know, the Pokemon Go version of that, it ain't so bad, you know, yeah, okay, so a little fidelity is lost in there, but, you know, it's not, not as bad as it could be. And, you know, you know, Arches National Park, yeah, okay, that kind of you know, disappears entirely. So that's, yeah, that was pretty bad. But I said, but you know, but on the other hand, think how useful all these tools are, right? This artificial, this uh, uh, augmented reality as a case study, you know, I use this feature all the time on my phone when I'm traveling or even at home trying to read books that, that, happen, that I happen to have in my library in different languages. I can pull out my phone and I can immediately, I've got my, I don't have a Babel fish in my ear, but I got a similar piece on my eyes and it, it actually is really great for, for, for reading foreign languages. Uh, and not only that, but you know, everybody from Facebook to Apple are now you know, moving out of having to use your phone to already now we're doing uh, glasses. In fact, it's interesting, this, this, this Apple one was supposed to come out last year, then it was supposed to come out this year, so maybe it'll come out sometime soon. But when these things do come out, you know, who wouldn't want their navigation system to be visible to them all the time? You know, if I could just be walking casually and always know where the navigation was, didn't have to keep pulling my phone out of my pocket and turning it back on and off, uh, uh, I, would, I would find that to be quite useful. And similarly, you know, when I would go to, you know, if I'm just in the world, whether it's for fun or for work, having that heads up display and probably some AI behind it, constantly bringing the information to the forefront that I will probably want to know before I make a choice, that will be again really useful. And, and what's interesting is I could not find an image for the thing I would find the most useful, and I think it's because they purposely didn't put it up there because of the concepts of invasion of privacy, which is the thing I would like the most is that when I look out into this room, I would see everybody's name hanging up over their head so I'd remember who the hell you all were, and it, I'd also be queued up as to when the last time we bumped into each other so I could remember some, say something relevant about, oh yes, I remember two days ago then. But that no one does that in their marketing, and I think it's uh, because they're afraid of that. But again, but that's the app, that's the first app I would go create or buy or, or, or use. Which brings me to something I did find, which was somebody who made a dystopian little movie about this. And so here, here this, uh, this is basically a dating app that they hy hypothesize, in this case called Wingman, where as you're here talking with somebody, it's watching the other person, bringing up their profile, watching for the mood of their reactions, making suggestions for you how to respond, to optimize your probabilities of engaging with this person socially. Uh, and by the way, this, move, this particular video ends with her figuring out he's using a dating app and so she, she walks away. But, but imagine this next level reality where, for example, let's say 20, 30, 40 years from now, we're walking around in the cities, everything's in a foggy haze of pollution. Uh, you have you know, homeless people or, you know, uh, or you know, people sick or whatever they might be hanging out on the, on the street edges, graffiti on all of the train tracks, you know, largely what we have now. Uh, but if, if in the AR realm, I could change that. 
And I could say, you know what, I want everybody to look like their avatars in the games that I like. Uh, and I'm gonna make the trains look futuristic and not covered with graffiti. And instead of a homeless person there, you know, let's just put an object I wouldn't wanna step on, uh, you know, like the little baby deer. And, you know, and maybe in the sky I'll see actually all the, waves, all the colors for the wavelengths of light that my eye can't normally perceive. Uh, you know, that might be cool. But the point is you could turn on and off all these functions independently if you wished. Or you could flip it the other way around. You could sit there and say, you know, hey, I, I would actually like to encourage behavior. I would gamify being a, a good behavior. And so, you know, if you do something helpful and kind to the homeless person, maybe you get some points for that. Uh, but I wanna show you a clip now that I know John uses in some of his, I think I showed you this clip originally. Am I the one that brought this clip to you? I uh, didn't, you found this on your own? Okay, all right. But uh, we both love this clip. At the very least, that's true. Uh, and uh, uh, this, this actually isn't even that new. This, this clip that you're about to see was made you know, four to six years ago. It's called Hyper Reality. It is at first shockingly overboard about what the world could be like, but if you sit and think about it here for a minute, you realize it really could be the way it ends up. So think about this, where your entire world is coded in augmented reality overlays. And that's everything from uh, you know, the bus they're telling you where, when you would want on to go into it, what's there, advertising to go in and out of every shop. Uh, you know, if you look there on the street that currently has the yellow green, uh, now it's telling you that, hey, by the way, there's about to be traffic, you might have to avoid stepping in the street. You know, all of these things, individually, all the things you see in here are things you can imagine would actually be very helpful and, uh, and or important to an advertiser. And the same thing true when you're going through your grocery store. And so this, by the way, this video goes on for you know, five or 10 minutes, but I think each scene they do is actually masterfully done as to show you both the good, the bad, and the ugly about uh, you know, how this ultimately might uh, occur. But, <clears throat> but you know, it's entirely possible that we'll just, all of these new techniques and technologies will just be, will just make life easier. And so this is sort of the, positive utopian ideal of where this might go. You know, you're, you not only do you have your little pop out, but here your electric car can also turn into an electric helicopter and carry you around your extremely green and lush environment around you. And, and so that's one possible future. But it's also possible that as we humans become more and more virtual, that AI and robotics start taking over the more and more physical. And this little clip is from an actual video game that is out right now. So, and when I looked at this clip, when I was looking for clips, I did not realize that's not a real person until I was watching it for a little while. This is in-game engine. This isn't even a pre-recorded movie. This is in the game engine of a video game. This is how good artificial characters look right now. And the, 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 the plot of this video game, as you can see, she has a little light up thing on her on her, her skull to give away that she's an AI, uh, but the whole point of the game is, is to talk about when, when do these AIs really become basically real. And right now in Japan, you can actually, there are dating apps for you to date virtual girlfriends, you know, in Japan that use technologies like this to give you your AI hypothetical non-existent partner. And, and you know, I'm, I know I'm leaping out a bit of the head, but, uh, uh, you know, Elon Musk has come out and said, you know, he thinks that artificial intelligence is the biggest existential threat to humanity. Stephen Hawking believes that AI will basically replace us all together. Steve Wozniak thinks that we won't be completely eliminated. The, the AIs will keep us as pets. Uh, and, and Elon believes, you know, that the way, the only way to fix this is to basically merge, to say basically the virtual world, the concepts of AI and humanity must ultimately merge together. And, and by the way, I think there's some odds that is the reality that will happen, you know, whether you uh, expect it to or want it to or not. But getting back to Earth and humans and being grounded as, as we started with John, I personally happen to be a fan of something that Jeff Bezos has evangelized for, which is we, as access to space is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, we can now begin to move manufacturing and and polluting, shall we call them, industries further and further away, including into space. We can bring back the resources we need, power, water, minerals from space. 
We can put our manufacturing further and further away into space. And that will begin to let us have the, let the Earth recover more like a park-like existence. And so we can quit you know, destroying this very fragile, beautiful place we have here on Earth. Even our population density can begin to move a bit out in space. Uh, and so I think that this, this is what I have as the hopeful future. And, and to wrap up, you know, I'm gonna even jump <clears throat> you know, much, much further ahead you know, to even saying, you know, where is this leading, not just tomorrow, but 10,000 years from now, where what has humanity become? And I actually think that in 10,000 years, we really will be spreading out throughout the galaxy. We will be doing that in concert with AIs. We'll have technologies that will not only extend the lives of the bodies that we have, but we'll be able to manufacture bodies that are even have better longevity. Uh, the concepts of whether you're a physical human or a physical uh, uh, or a robotic structure in essence, I think will begin to blur dramatically, uh, but that we will uh, ultimately survive. The real challenge is gonna be how much of our humanity uh, survives. Uh, but fundamentally, I'd, li I'd like to close by just saying, you know, I really am an optimist. I really think that we, you know, we really do live in a completely wonderful world it is awesome and awe-inspiring and important. Uh, there are some amazing challenges that we are going to have to go through before we get to that 10,000 year future. But I personally have faith, faith that we can, we can navigate that with the help of great artists like John Mack. Thank you. One of the things I was curious to ask you about, um, we, we talked a lot about the you know, exploring, we've talked about a lot about my video games, but this is the first time I put those future things into a presentation that we got to talk about. So I'm just curious, how, how scared are you about the future? In other words, I know you have this sort of wake up call moment, but how doom and gloomy do you feel about the potential future for humanity uh, outside of even the physical existence to do you know, asteroids and climate change, uh, just the humanity aspect? How doom and gloomy do you feel or, or how do you think like, we'll figure it out, we'll get through it? So you kind of know me as the doom and gloom. Can you hear me? You kind of know me as the doom and gloom. Last time I get a, gave a talk was at uh, Galex in the uh, Azores Islands. And when I came back to the audience after my talk, Richard sat down next to me and shook my hand and said, doom and gloom, thanks a lot, John. So you know me as the doom and gloom guy, but I'm actually not so gloomy. Um, the course of the future can be changed in a second. I have someone here who disagrees with me. <laughs> if it is the human itself that is paving the path for the future, then all it takes is an individual change to change that course. Now, will eight billion people do that all at once? Probably not. And in that case, I would agree with the woman sitting here in the front. But individually, I think for an individual, humanity can be saved before I finish this sentence. Um, so, yeah, I think that's just the simple answer. Yeah, well, it, <clears throat> you know, and um, uh, I was talking with some of your staff in, in, the, in the back just before we came out here. And, um, you know, what uh, I mentioned on my last slide, I'm pretty hopeful. And, but the reason why I'm hopeful is that, uh, you know, while I see, you know, if I look at art forms in general, I think video games, Pokemon, the things we do, they're, they're art, fundamentally they're art. And uh, if you look at other forms of art that have come before, everything from writing books, which have been around for thousands of years, uh, making pottery or paintings, which has been around thousands of years, uh, or music, which has also been around even probably longer, um, you know, if you, if you go to a, a library or a random uh, art studio here in New York and, or a museum and you pick up, you just pick one item out at random, that thing probably won't speak to you, right? If you pick up a random book, it's probably not gonna be the topic you care about, it may not even be the language you can read, uh, may not be an author whose writing you enjoy. You have to work to find art that is curated to your personal interests. But once you do, once you find art, Good art, in my mind, 
almost universally, a person who appreciates a piece of art appreciates it because it, speak to, it speaks to them at some deeper level than just its aesthetic. Uh, the poetry is good not only because the words have good iambic pentameter, but because the message is something that resonates with me. Uh, and, but if you look at computer games, they've only been around not thousands of years, only dozens of years. And so it's not, not surprising that that art form is still coarse, it's still in its infancy. And people both writing them and buying them to a large degree are buying them for the eye candy. And computers are still getting twice as powerful every year or so as the eye candy is getting better really fast. And so to take the, the amount of work and money it takes just to make the eye candy is so vast, it's right up to billions of dollars going into each game we make. Uh, and that's just to get the eye candy right. And then we sell a first person shooter that is pretty shallow because all you do is run around and shoot things and get more powerful, which is sort of the plot of every game since the beginning of games, because eye candy still dominates. But we're only just now to the point where uh, reality engines are off the shelf. And so making the game look realistic or have like that woman, you know, which even I didn't realize was virtual until I watched it for a little while, uh, those are now basically off the shelf. And so now we're seeing actually games that game creators no longer care about how the game looks. There's more retro games becoming popular because the graphics is no longer the hard part. Now what's hard is why am I there? Why do I care about being in this game? Other than the uh, uh, hunt, you know, the, 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 uh, the psychological addiction challenge and reward cycle, which all games have and all apps that help you buy groceries or you know, even get a taxi home, all those things are gamified in the same way to try to make you like theirs. So, so if, if, if everything is equally gamified, everything has equal eye candy, now I care about content. And so we're, it will get that way. We will, we're, we're gonna get through this period of eye candy dominates, and I think we're just beginning to open up the era of uh, 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 now quality matters, content matters. I think something going on here that I'd like to talk about is why is that eye candy more sweet than reality? Why is the screen more tasty and pleasurable than this? And the reason I say that is because you brought, you brought up gaming as art. And you think of ceramics, you think of a Picasso, it's in a frame. It's very hard for a, to, to take a Picasso and replace the rest of the world with it. Or a pot, you can't, you can't replace reality with a pot. There's something going on with these new environments that are fully immersive, that are so sweet and tasty that, and so sort of elastic, they are, I think people are thinking it's better than the real thing. Well, but, but think about it this way too. Think about education. Um, education is being greatly enhanced by technology. And if you go back to the worst old ways of schools that are you know, uh, exaggerated in old movies, you know, where somebody drones on from behind the desk. Well, I, went, I went to a history class at the University of Texas with 500 people in a big auditorium and somebody in the front droning on like in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and I'm going like, this is painful. And I literally just quit going to that class. <laughs> One of the first ones I flunked. And, uh, uh, but yet I think any of us who, you know, and ultimately I now have a great appreciation for history. Once I realized I needed it as a tool and I saw the interesting aspects of it and I found a way to consume it that I could tolerate and not just tolerate, but appreciate. And one of the things that video game type technology does is it provides us this knowledge in a way that we can not only tolerate, but frankly appreciate. And that often means getting to the point quickly. That often means, tell me why I care. That often means, you know, show it to me in a way that's visually interesting. And, and technology can do that across the board. And so I really think the issue is, the reason why that candy is so sweet is because, you know, I, I think about, you know, no pain, no gain with exercise. The same thing is true where, like one of the, the, up until I went to space, the most awesome place by far I had ever been on the surface of the earth 
was the deep interior of Antarctica where I saw what looked like a Tim Burton movie come to life where the catabatic winds coming from the South Pole over a mountain range had dug a deep gouge along an entire mountain range in the two mile thick ice sheet of Antarctica and created what looked like a giant frozen tidal wave that I kept expecting to see you know, dinosaurs frozen in the water as I walked by it, uh, 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 which obviously didn't, sadly weren't there. Uh, if I was playing Pokemon Go, they probably would have been, but you know. Uh, but, the, but that was literally awesome. It was awe-inspiring in the most magical laws of physics have changed around me, alien I could poss thing I could possibly imagine. But it also took me a month to get there and out. It cost me a lot of money to get there and out. Uh, we were really endangered to get there in and out. And so it goes back to that no pain, no gain. And so the, the advantage that games have had is that it's a way to get that awesome experience with a tiny fraction of the money, a tiny fraction of the pain to go through to get there. So you mentioned education, and I was mentioning gaming that replaces reality, right? So what I, it looks like, if I could just synthesize that, we're talking about technology as a tool and technology as a reality. So when is that line crossed? Because when you speak about doom and gloom, I think that right there is the trigger. Well, so, it, so it's interesting that the, the line you refer to, so you're coming to this from the line of my reality is being encroached upon by digital. I come from, this, from the side of my virtual realities are overlaying more and more on top of your reality, so to speak. Um, I think that crossing the line is, well, you're, you're illuminating right here. It's happening. It's already begun. And in my mind, it will continue. Here, there, it is, you know, which actually was one of the other things I was thinking we, we could talk about it was, uh, could you, would you stop it? You know, I don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's possible to stop. I mean, I literally think even if all of us decided, you know, we should have a new rule that said, you know, virtual world and the real world should somehow have some level of separation people would laugh at that. I mean, we literally have zero traction. And, uh, uh, and so, so, the, uh, so, so it has begun. It's going to get deeper and deeper. What we really have to decide now is, is you know, what's okay? It's, it's like that Wingman app. When, when the reality and fantasy intertwine, um, you know, we're, we're going to actually literally be in the real world and not know if the person sitting next to us at the dinner table is real or not. I mean, that's literally, we're going to, that's going to happen. And uh, so it's going to be, you know, it's going to be odd. So, so I don't think this is about stopping technology. I don't think it's, it's about stopping virtual worlds or realities. It's about how are we positioned with the evolution and progress of these games and technologies? It seems to me right now, and I say this often, that if you're standing at an ocean, there are three positions you can be standing in, or three positions at the beach. One is you're out in the ocean floating on a raft, and the current is pulling you wherever, wherever it wants to pull you. You don't even know where you're going because you're, you are the current itself. And then you can get to shallower water where you put your foot down. Maybe it's one foot. Maybe it's two feet. But when you have a foot on the ground, you feel the current for the first time. The other position is just out of the water altogether, and you're just watching, just pure observation. If we don't get a toe on the sand below us, this current is going to pull us into places where, well, where we're going to reach a tipping point where we won't be able to go back to what it means to be human. And so I don't think this is a problem of technology. I think it's a problem of you know, progress is this horizontal line and it's moving so quickly. And I always say, if we move two units horizontally in progress, we better, use, we better be moving three units vertically, which means closer to ourselves. And I, I'm speaking really just spiritually because progress has taken such a lead that it's only going to reflect our stagnant evolution. And I think that's what we're witnessing here. And if we're not careful, we're going to be lured into a false paradise. And this false paradise is, oh, 
even better than the real thing. And I always say, if you think it's better than the real thing, you have not experienced the real thing yet. Right? Yeah. Well, first, I agree with all that. Um, and I think that toe touching the ground is profoundly important. And I think this is exactly an example of that moment. Um, the piece I would add was, would be that uh, you used, one of, the, one of the words you said was to be able to go back, metaphorically, you didn't say to the beach, but I took it as to the beach. But I actually don't think we can go back to the beach. You know, the, the importance of knowing where, without a toe on the, on, on the ground below the water, you won't know the direction of, the, of the, the current is taking you, and we will be dragged off to that false paradise. But we're going to be dragged somewhere. And it's the one direction I don't think it can go is back to the beach. And, and so now what's important is first get the toe down and then look out into that vast ocean and say, should we be going north, south, east, or west in that vast ocean? And how do we get there? And so that's what I think the important part is, is to reflect on our humanity, understand the technology is going to move faster and faster. You saw, just, you look, you know, you saw the graph, the, the, the hockey stick graph of population. There's a similar hockey stick graph, graph of the rate of change of technology. You know, the, uh, the way overused adage of, you know, any technology sufficiently advances indistinguish indistinguishable magic is, you know, not only true for us versus our parents, but it's gonna be true next, next year compared to this year, uh, and, and, and then pretty soon next week compared to last week. And so this, this is gonna go faster and faster and faster and faster. And so keeping that toe down is gonna become more and more and more challenging each year. Definitely, because sticking to that analogy, we're, we're trying to find the bottom for our foot to touch the ocean, but they, and I just say the powers that be, are raising the water level, okay? And it's, and it's under the guise of freedom. So, I mean, one thing that, that I thought was very interesting about your presentation is, and you speak about, you know, we want that toe on the ground to reflect on our humanity. Uh, there, were, there was this uh, video, he had these um, lenses of augmented reality where, you know, it's pollution, so you made the day beautiful, and you took away the graffiti, and there was a monorail instead of a subway, and the homeless man turned into a deer, and I, I, I love that. Everybody turned into their avatars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. So I'm Lord British. I, that is where we're heading. And what's interesting about that to me is the only reason someone would put a deer there is because there's an uncomfort that they don't want to look at in themselves. The only reason anybody would want to alter that reality in order to give them a sense of peace is because they haven't realized yet how to fix this reality so that this doesn't matter. I don't mean doesn't matter, but their peace is unconditional. And I find that's where these glasses are taking us. They're taking us to a place where we don't have to change. The computer will change it for us. Technology is performing the enlightenment for us. Well, but, yeah. but, but as you have well said, not just now, but even earlier too, you, you, which is that this is a false paradise in that if we ignore the, re the reality of the pollution and the graffiti and the homeless, it will get worse until the entire thing collapses. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, what, what I find interesting is um, uh, something I was talking about with somebody in, in the back earlier, uh, maybe, maybe I was talking with you about it, was, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of us who have a common experience of, of playing in virtual worlds of Ultima Online together, um, you know, we, we've often talked about the fact that we both really appreciate the depth of the, you know, the artificial reality that we share, and yet we also all greatly appreciate that sometimes we have logged out of that, and we go find each other in the real world. We go sit down at a bar or a restaurant and, and, and get to know like 
who are you? Where are you from? And you know, what's your life like when you're not in the virtual world? Because I've been really curious as to you know, what are each of our separate journeys were that brought us to this similar condition. And, uh, and so uh, going back to that whole love and death you know, in virtual worlds, which is, a, is again where it can have a real positive benefit. And so um, uh, it's gonna be, this is, the, this is the way you have to find a way to navigate. I, I really like what you just said there because it wasn't just you met in a game but you went to find them in the real world. And let me, so here's why I find that important. Do you remember he had uh, this game up here where he spoke about a guy named Bob who ended up dying in the real world and, his, and the gamers didn't know what had happened to Bob. They didn't know how to get in touch with Bob. Do you see the gap? So, and, and I think, and we spoke about this earlier, I had asked you today, you know, relationships are real in the online gaming community and there's meaning there. But if we went to an extreme where we're all just living in the metaverse, something would be lost. And, I, and we didn't land on that, but I wonder if that's it. Does it have to always come back to the non-digital? Ah, you know, that's, the, uh, that's a good question. And I think that there are people who would answer yes and no. Um, I think both of us would say we would be most comfortable and presume that it would only be possible that for this to be a permanent forever relationship would mean that it had to transcend the virtual and had to have a stake also in the physical reality. But I know individuals who, uh, who, would, who would say the other. They would actually say for whatever reasons they are Maybe perhaps, and I'm making this up, but perhaps they are you know, closed in enough in the real world, whether that's physically shuttered in or emotionally or intell you know, uh, intellectually in some way shuttered in, that the virtual world becomes their ability to get out and see and express and interact in ways they are not able to do in the real world for a variety of complicated reasons. And so I think those people would go, you know what, that is my reality and I am perfectly happy with it. And when I check out of the virtual reality because I have to go to the bathroom or eat, that is my, uh, uh, a, a, a reality I have to face, but otherwise I'm going back in. Okay, so, and it's right there where I would say, hang on a second. I, rather than saying, that's my reality there, if they could say, that's my tool there, these are my, these are my, in my reality, I remember when Second Life came out and um, people who couldn't get to say a shrink, therapy, would actually have their session in Second Life. I thought, wow, that's an interesting mix of reality there. And I saw the game as a tool. So here's someone in rural who knows where America getting access to things through a game platform. And it's, it's really my hope that as we navigate through this, that someone in that kind of a position still knows what reality is and knows what the tool is and doesn't confuse the two because the problem, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm very clear about this, the problem is not the technology, the problem is perception and the power that we're giving these things. So, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, hey, uh, great really, um, a discourse between you two or, or conversation. Thank you, for, thank you for bringing us together. Yeah, you're welcome. So E.O. Wilson, who coined the term biodiversity, said when he was a young boy, he was so bored and, and really disassociated with people around a bad childhood that he just went in the woods and sat and he was bored and he started studying ants. And you sort of wonder that that lack of boredom or being less than comfortably numb you know, from a poet's standpoint, or even a creativity, would sort of mute real creativity from extreme highs and lows and where people create from. The other thing is I've kind of noticed throughout this presentation is the virtual world, there's 6,000 languages spoken on Earth. And there's a saying that every time that a language is lost, and 3,000 of them are, you know, almost extinct, that a library is burnt down. So I think in the virtual world, what I'm seeing is that the language or diversity of thought is written really through 
you know, a very narrow scope of people who are very similarly minded. You know, you show Elon Musk, who I know is a friend of yours, and Jeff Bezos, who's a friend. And so you're all, when you get people who think the same way or are similar in thought, you will always have the same outcome. And so I, I see that this virtual world has just muted all sorts of diversity, which creates humanity. So that's sort of well, the observation. Well, let me, you, you, there's two things in there that I'd like to talk about. One is the uh, importance of boredom. Uh, and the, the second one is uh, uh, to your do virtual worlds squash diversity. Uh, uh, first of all, the importance of boredom. That's one of the things we talked about when we were kind of walking through the exhibit here tonight was... Uh, Not because he was bored, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, but, but as you go from the upstairs where you have full bandwidth to down just on the other side of this wall where you get no connection... Uh, and you're left there with the black and white unchanging backdrops uh, because you can't get your candy fix of the virtual world, uh, that that leaves you in the, you know, the sensations of despair and other you know, negative, negative traits. And, and I said, you know, what's interesting about that here is that's actually really important for humans. You know, I, I can't tell how many times I've ultimately been stuck whether that's literally in the physical world, like trying to climb, uh, you know, to get out of a ditch that I really need to get on the other side and I cannot figure out a way to get across it. And so I am sit down in the mud stuck or in front of a computer trying to write a program, you know, metaphorically stuck or code wise stuck. And you kind of sit there and you just have to f figure it out at some point on your own. And it's those times you're stuck and bored with nothing to do that suddenly creativity happens and you, you, your mind wanders to a wide, much wider array of, of options, and so that's good. And the uh, one of the problems of easily accessible candy of any kind, and this is sugary candy for your children, or video games for your children, or us, uh, is that it's easy to be distracted by those permanently. And so there's no question that candy of all forms, psychological and physical, has to be managed. But, uh, but on your other issue of diversity, you'll notice there was another slide I put up there that was about all the specialized subgroups, whether that's you know, community, you know, uh, pen pals with inmates to uh, how ready are you to go to heaven? People, you know, we have an, I would say we have an, an interesting, almost opposite problem where you can find any niche you want to online. The problem is that you're only connected to that niche. And so it becomes the echo chamber that we see all the time now in politics where, you know, we, 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 we've lost our ability to communicate with each other and find centrist positions because instead we go into our little fiefdoms of my whole life is pen pals with inmates and uh, uh, instead of getting out and, and, and seeing all the rest of the pieces. The, the games are still written, no matter what group it is. Uh, the games are still written, no matter what group it is, by someone generally with an engineering sort of view on things. And when I talk about diversity, I'm just talking about people, you know, if you look at Aboriginal Australia, they look at a rock or a tree very different than you would, which means their perspective would be so far afield from yours. And I think that because when you put the, the realm of creation into just engineers of a Western, you know, Caucasian generally or Asian thing, mm -hmm. that you get a very muted view, even though you go under the guise that it's somebody with long hair or this or that, it's still more or less the same point No, no, well, yeah, no, so if you're, if you're arguing that is there a danger to uh, virtualizing every, everything, of course there is. But uh, you know, it's interesting, those, the Apple glasses that, that uh, I showed up there, one of the things that, that came up for me when I looked at those was I was going, you know, what I would love as an explorer is to go walk through the woods with an AI uh, assistant that when I looked down at a, a, a rotting log would go, hey, by the way, there's a, you know, significantly increased probability you'll find a snake or an interesting bug or whatever else if you just look under that log. And uh, that would help me go into nature and make those discoveries on my own. And even would be there as my assistant to catalog anything new that we happen to find, whether it's, uh, look, I did the gene sequence of a new piece of, you know, some new DNA that had never been found. And so I think, you know, these exact same tools that people find scary are the exact same tools that will also can help us enormously. It, it all depends on whether we get a toe back down there on the ground and whether we manage to know where this is dragging us because the current is, is going to get faster and faster and faster and it's going to be harder and harder to control. 
faster and much more manipulative, definitely. Thank you, wonderful program. Richard, you mentioned candy management, so we'll go there. You're a parent, your kids are not yet teens. There was a great program, thank you, John, for everything. There was a great program earlier this week on youth and social media and impact on their brains and kind of just the future use of tech. So I'm curious how you as a parent think about candy management, moderation, what should we be thinking about with, with our children? Yeah, well, the, the good news for parents, in my mind, is how well the technology has evolved just in recent, and my kids are now 10, my, old, my daughter, their oldest is 10. And uh, you know, when she was two or three and first beginning to have the possibility of having a digital device in her hand, first thing I did as a good parent was I went out and canvassed what exists, what could I, would I, or should I let my child have, and what would I have them avoid? And the good news was, is wow, there were a bunch of new, great discovery apps about how to at least move things around and how to learn about the basics of life through uh, interactive play that I found were very, very powerful. And so I immediately said, there's at least some fraction of my kids' day, I'm willing to let them do that. And, and as they got older, you know, even at that time, I went, yeah, when they turn five, there's not, nothing going to be there for them. But fortunately, the, the industry seems to have been, this is, my kids are at just the right age to see this wave change, where right now, if you're a parent of, say, eight and 10-year-olds, like I am, there are great things you can sit, put, unleash, uh, unleash them into, as well as things they should clearly avoid. And, uh, uh, and so, for example, if, uh, if your kids have not yet been exposed to Roblox and Minecraft, buy it for them now. And uh, uh, it, those are literally... Uh, games that I believe are incredibly important to lead you on the journey of not just being a consumer of all this content, but ultimately to understand the concepts and methods of creation. And, and if we want to have any hope of people not becoming slaves to it, but helping to reflect on it and change it, they need to understand how it works. And Roblox and Minecraft, after you play a few levels on it, they both encourage you to figure out how to rearrange the world with the objects in it. Then they, figure, then they teach you how to change the rules of the objects so you can make gravity reverse or water flow uphill or whatever it might be. And then ultimately they help you go just write the underlying code of the whole thing and just make a whole new game if you want to. And, uh, uh, and so I got those from my kids and my kids have both, even my eight year old now has written his own complete, uh, in this case, Roblox game. Uh, they're doing it, in, he's doing it in school now too. And, uh, uh, and so there are definitely things that are positive time that they can spend online. Now, on the other hand, there's things they'll just spend time on, like social media, just chatting with their friends. And that's no better or worse than sitting on the phone all day and all night with your friends that we had as kids. But I think that should be, it's okay in moderation. And then there are things, you know, like art you may not like as a parent, like Grand Theft Auto, where the goal of it is to be a thug and murder, maim, and steal. And... You know, and as an artist, I'm going, you know, you can paint a painting that is as rude and offensive and angry as you want, and I have no problem with an artist making that art. And, uh, but just like we have, you know, R-rated movies, we have adult-rated games, too. There's rating systems for games, and there's, as a parent, you absolutely need to be aware of what your kids are doing. Like, you know, my daughter weirdly got into watching open-heart surgeries and brain surgeries when she was very young, which I let her do. Uh, but, uh, and, and she didn't happen to bump into Grand Theft Auto, so I haven't had to, like, try to manage her out of it. And so, uh, uh, you know, we'll see where that leads. Uh, I, would, I would just like to say on this, this word candy, this sweet, what tastes so bad in our normal day that makes us want candy so much? Because if we don't figure that out, We are the consumed while we're consuming. And if we could figure out what tastes so bland or sour or bitter, whatever that is, we're talking about duality here, pleasure, pain, right? Boredom, entertainment. That landscape of pain, of boredom, of the sour, 
Is that something we're doing to our moment? Is that something we can change without depending on third parties to take us out of that state? And the question is, I find, if you can unravel what's causing that, is there a sweetness that crushes everything we've known to be candy? I said before, if you think it's better than the real thing, you haven't seen the real thing. And I'll say this as well. And once that space is landed upon, it crushes all simulation. Because simulation can never compete with the original. And so I find the real pandemic moving forward and the real issue on the table, it's not just the business models, it's not just the designers, it's not just the legislation, I get it, it's important. It's, can we land on the original? But, but here's, I think, the challenge you're, you're facing that is gonna be difficult. You know, you look at the beautiful pictures we have in this room. Each one of these is quite unique, but they are not next door to each other, and none of them are next door to my house. And think about, as you were talking, I was thinking about farm kids versus city kids. And I'm going like, oh, the farm kids are lucky they got nature out the backyard, but it's the same little patch of nature always in their backyard. And my kids here in New York City have the same patch of an urban environment outside of their front door. And for us, well, at least I, I know, you know, genetically, I haven't actually tested this particular gene, I haven't looked for this gene, but I'm, I have to imagine I have the novelty-seeking gene. And, uh, and so as a novelty seeker, it, it is extremely fulfilling to see the sweetness of every one of these things which I am lucky to be able to afford to go do myself. Lucky to have the time, lucky to have the money. Uh, but you look about most of the city kids who are stuck in their urban reality, or you look at the farm kids who are stuck in their farm reality, and I'm going, they're not gonna see all this. And, and by the way, you know, I've never been on their farm, so I'm gonna go look under their logs and find it amazing to find what colonies of things are living under their logs. But they've already looked under their logs. And, and so, the, uh, to the degree that novelty seeking is part of the human experience, which even if you're not as hardcore as I am, I think it is, then uh, it, it may be um, a little too innocent to, to think that, to say, sit down whoever you are, young child, in whatever part of the reality you find yourself, and that should be enough for you when there's this other thing available. Definitely, definitely. And that comment that I gave there was more for the adults than the kids. I wouldn't like sit your child down and talk about that. But <clears throat> these landscapes here are really a symbol for something. It's interesting. I, I, I've taught a course in Lisbon and, and I, I open the class. It's a master's class, master's uh, students. And I open the class saying, I want everybody in this room right now to draw me a rectangle with only three lines in it. And they sit there for about five minutes and no one can do it. Like, you can't do it, it's impossible. And then I show them my picture, it's a rectangle and I put three lines in it, okay? That's what I asked them to do. Why couldn't they do it? Because the program, the patterning is so subtle that it veils the obvious and I'm not proposing that we go travel around the world and go to different landscapes. There's a whole industry that's going to, going to sell you that experience. What I am saying is, how do you get off the program so that the moment that you're in right now is always new and fresh? And I think a lot of you say you've got the novelty gene, that seeking of novelty. I mean, I, I do think that's something that's, um, important and sort of innate in all of us. It's just, the question then is, is, is that a novelty? Because once you find that novelty, how long does it take for that novelty to get old? I mean, I remember Pokemon Go was new and novel 
And sure enough, to keep market share, they've got to upgrade the software. I'm level 40. <laughs> yeah. So we're going, you find novelty, it gets old after a while because of the experience, the programming of the same, right? So they have to upgrade it. Then they have to upgrade that. Then they have to upgrade that. I mean, I don't think Apple has to change their, their operating systems on their phone as often as they do. But it's like eye candy. It feels fresh. It feels new. So I'm just a little bit concerned when we search for novelty, how long does it stay novel? And then how quickly are we asking for the next upgrade? And where does that put us? in the false paradise. So you guys talked about the future of technology a lot, uh, but John, you brought up the idea of spirituality and also like straying away from ourselves. So I wonder, especially as people my age are kind of straying away from any sort of religion or kind of touching any of that, uh, what do you guys think the future of spirituality is? Or like, what are, what are the ways that we're gonna find ourselves and explore ourselves in our own mind? Well, interestingly, uh, this is an issue that I love to tackle in games. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. What, the, the reason why I used the word avatar and brought that into gaming was I said, I want to make a game that instead of just killing monsters and collecting treasure and leveling up, I want to put you into a mentally challenging circumstance. And if you rob, cheat, and steal, that ought to not be the way to win. It ought to, you, you clearly, you know, the bad guys are trying to lie, cheat, and steal. If you're supposed to be the hero of the land, you ought to do it in some method other than lying and cheating and stealing. So it's pretty easy to go, lying and cheating and stealing is bad. But if I'm gonna make any other moral stand or ethical stand, I'm going like, I need to know, like, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna do a game about the Ten Commandments? And I'm going like, no, nah, that didn't feel right for me. Am I gonna do a game about the Seven Deadly Sins? That makes good scary movies, but that's not for me. Uh, and so I said, I, I've gotta go read philosophy. And so I actually went and I bought every books about every religion on the history of the earth that I could find. Uh, I read all the Greek and Roman philosophical texts. And that's where I actually came across this Sanskrit word avatar. Uh, and as I was working this out, I was going, you know, if, if I'm going to put you in a circumstance where you will be punished for doing wrong, quote unquote wrong, then it's important that the character you're playing in the game is you, not you're not playing Conan the Barbarian, who's supposed to be a thug. You're supposed to be you. And even though you might look like Conan the Barbarian, it's important that it's your soul or your spirit embodied in that character. And so that's why I borrowed the word avatar. And, uh, but then I sat down and I actually put a lot of thought into what am I going to talk about in games? And, uh, uh, and by no means, but I'm just describing my way I did it just says I think out of, out of interest, but by no means do I think this is important to solve the problem you're describing, but this is one approach. What I did is I went through all these books. I'd been using highlighters and post-it notes throughout all of these reading that I'd done. And at the end of reading all these books, I went, I don't believe any of them. I don't want to espouse any of them. And so I'm going like, you know, they all seemed out of date in some sense of the word to me. And so I said, wow, but they all had good concepts, right? You know, being kind is clearly good. Being honest is clearly good. And so there were definitely truths through all of them. And so what I did is I took a blank wall in my room and I put a line across literally the midpoint in the line and I put post-it notes and said, truth, that's a good thing. Falsehood, that's a bad thing. You know, and I put things above and below the line that were obviously things that motivated people to do good or do bad. And then I began to group them together and I would say, oh, love and compassion, kind of the same thing in a sense, or at least clearly related. I'd put those words nearby each other. And then I began to sweep up little molehills of concepts that I thought people could agree would be good and concepts people would agree would be bad and ultimately arrived at truth, love, and courage. And, I, and at least in my mind's eye, I could see a lot of other things being combinations like justice is sort of, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth isn't quite right. You also need to know that if a child stole something to feed itself, you probably have compassion and do something other than cut off the kid's hand, you know? And, uh, uh, and so I began to kind of evolve this fictional but thoughtful uh, idea as to how I could create a gaming experience that the world would respond to your behavior in a way that people would not find fatally flawed. And, uh, and when I started down that, I was actually very happy with it, and it, it's what I really think put my games on the map for the long haul, was that I did begin to care about the 
concept of, and I'll use the word directly, spirituality. In fact, I, I built eight virtues from those three. I built honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, and humility. And the spirituality in the case of my games was not meant to be religious uh, spirituality in the sense of a deity. It was meant specifically about this self-reflection, about caring, you know, who am I as a person? Why, what, what do I exist for? What, what is, you know, what am I leaving behind me as a trail of the impact that, I, that, that will outlast me? Um, uh, and so caring and caring and crafting about my inner being is, became one of the, the, the goals in the game. And so I think games can do this is the point. Uh, I've made a, a career out of doing this in games. And I, and I think that even, even though I was doing it kind of head on, I mean, it literally was the mechanics of the game, but I think that even great art of all kinds, you know, a, 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 a piece of, I'm trying to think of a piece of art that people might have thought of that challenged them. I mean, I'm old enough to wear interracial kisses on television or in print were shocking or same sex embraces would, you know, would be considered edgy. And the reason why they were considered edgy is because they, they pushed a button that made a lot of people feel uncomfortable. And if it made you uncomfortable, you immediately had to sit back. If you were an intelligent, rational person, as opposed to shunning it, you'd go like, why did that make me feel uncomfortable? What is it about, what do I, what's wrong in me that that pushed my button? They pushed my button on purpose, it worked, but I am now gonna change myself because that really shouldn't push my button. And so that's the sort of stuff I love doing in games that I think is what makes great art is to hold a mirror up to the player and go, here is how you might look to yourself if you really look deeply. I think, I mean really, we need more gamers like this. He has put thoughtfulness embedded in entertainment. I mean imagine what we could learn about ourselves in gaming. He's fused the human with the tech, right? Um, so thank you, I, we, we just clone you. Uh, I would like to speak to your question from, it's so interesting how you and I speak about the same things but come from different sides. So I'm gonna answer the same question from sort of the angle that I come in. If you're born Catholic and then become a New Ager and then become a Buddhist, are you upgrading the program? I love it when people say, oh, I'm very spiritual or he's very spiritual or I wonder what that means. Because if that person's spiritual, then that would mean that I guess there's someone else over there that isn't spiritual. So there must be an image of what spiritual looks like. And the moment you're devoted to an image, you haven't landed on the original. You have replaced the abstraction. You have replaced the original with an abstraction. So I'd be very careful with spirituality and what you buy into because it might be consuming you in the same way that the Pokemon Go image has replaced the original. With the younger generation like you mentioned, here's what I would say, not what spirituality looks like, but here's an act that I think would be approaching the original. And I've said this before, so sorry if uh, you've heard it again. And we'll just talk about gaming and boredom. The next time you reach into your pocket and grab your phone, can you take the slightest bit of distance from your action and ask yourself, am I grabbing this phone right now because I need it, I need to make a call, or am I grabbing this phone right now because I'm bored? If you can spot that, it takes, it's a matter of a second, and it's just about remembering to do it. Then you plant a seed for something that is very spiritual because you're then able to spot 
a reaction. A reaction to what? A reaction to boredom. And then you want to unwind what boredom is. How does it come about? And uh, when you do that, yeah, see what happens when you do that. John, I, I feel like uh, a number of times you've mentioned that there's a, there's a big distinction between the real thing and, and the simulation. Uh, and that's definitely apparent today in, in, in this exhibit, but how do you think your thoughts might change when, if we ever reach a, a, a future where there isn't, where a, vir a virtual reality is completely indistinguishable from, from you know, the reality that we're in right now? That's a great question. That's the danger because what used to be a projection of the mind, which you could always undo, okay, is now becoming that projection, which is, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's, I, you know, if this half of the room is uh, from Russia and this half is from Ukraine, you're being flooded with imagery very different from you're being flooded with imagery. The propaganda is totally different and you're gonna see the world totally differently when it comes to certain topics, right? That's not an image that you can like grab. It's happening in the psyche. So presence would be to get off all that imagery and come down to truth, okay? Are you with me so far? What's happening digitally now is that that imagery is now manifesting as real imagery and real word, worlds that we can actually move through as avatars. Which means if I am an avatar in the metaverse, I can get off of all my psychological programming and come to presence within a false world. So what's happening is enlightenment is going to be possible in somebody else's prison. That makes sense? But it's the enlightenment yeah. that the prison warden wanted you to have. Without question. Okay. Which is the danger. Which is the new God. Correct. Who is the person who takes credit for the coining the word avatar? That would be me. You? Coining the term in the way it is used in virtual realities, yes. Because I thoroughly object to the selling of the word avatar, which comes from this amazing language. Oh, yes, I agree. That we will never see the likes of again. No, Sanskrit. no. And by the way, I have described that that's where I borrowed it from was directly from the Sanskrit when I was reading Hindu texts looking for philosophy to then resonate inside of a gameplay activities. So you acknowledge what an... Totally. Um, that, you know, it's as rare as Shakespeare Sanskrit. It, it, we of course. Like no, no, of course, what absolutely. What about tonight's evening is to, it's obvious that we're living in a colossal failure of the world. And... All, these, all this energy that's going into problem solving should solve the problem of teaching mankind or understanding why mankind has failed to live in peace and harmony. And we're a hair's breadth from being totally annihilated by all these nuclear weapons. And I just deplore the failure of academics and all the other uh, people who have the capacity of addressing their energy to solving the problem of mankind, to find out why, since the beginning of the presence of human beings, they've never learned to live or in a constant state of war. And I don't see any efforts in academia from psychology ah. or sociology. Or uh, uh, well, please, let me address this one head on. There is no question that the challenges that humanity faces right now are epic, and they go, in my mind, the problems in the real, the, the physical world, the outside of our, even interpersonal between people, you know, stems from energy to fresh water to food security to climate change 
to uh, this litany of things that stack upon each other to make each other harder. Then you go to the interpersonal ones that you were talking about, which is why is it that the hum what humans, eight billion of us, are still, in this day and age, still willing to literally kill and maim and destroy and create insecurity, not only between the two uh, you know, direct partners, but across the globe, create inflation, lack of food security, all this long litany of things. And then you go on top of that, the stuff John's talking about of where is the humanity as this virtual world stuff is kicking over? Okay, so this is a, this is a third order problem down that we're talking about here today. But I would actually say this third order problem is absolutely entangled with those first two already, deeper than, 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 you, than, than, than we may have expressed to communicate. But let me give you some examples of that. I already told you how people fall in love in virtual, game, in virtual worlds and how people feel the loss of people on the other side of the globe. And I think I mentioned how people learn other languages by the need to communicate with their new friends that are on the other side of the globe. I actually absolutely believe that connecting people between cultures across this globe absolutely is a positive force for peace and justice across the globe. It is very common right now in Ukraine and Russia, the people I talk to in the gaming community that have been friends for tens of years who are all going like, how can this possibly happen? This is my... They have friends and family literally across country by country by country by country because the virtual world does not see the borders of the physical world. It is, they are, they're zero, they don't exist. And so this connectivity, you know, connecting people in the virtual world has huge problems that we're talking about. But it also offers huge hope to allow people to reach out beyond the traditional boundaries of the real world. Not only does it let you speak to, you know, connect and have deep relationships with people in physically other territories, there are people of different religious backgrounds that don't find out about their religious backgrounds that used to be at war with each other until they've already become friends for 10 years in a virtual world that didn't talk about that subject. And then they find out, oh, you have this alien belief that I used to think of as, you know, problematic, but now I realize you're a normal person, so how could I possibly hate you? And so there are absolute huge positive things. But what I think you can't do, uh, and uh, something I do take issue with more directly, so I think, first of all, there's more hope than you, would, than you felt. But what, what I don't think you'll find is the person who's calling it might be to either go out and explore or calling it might be to go make a game to tell those people, instead, you should take your brain power and go to the United Nations and convince people to, be, to lay down their arms and be peaceful with each other, that would be a waste of time. I would fail at it, and I'm, I'm using me as the example, but I mean, I th think, you know, whatever other people's jobs and callings are, uh, you need to let people work in the area, they are skilled, work in the area, they are motivated, but continue these conversations to make sure that all of us are, pulling, are rowing in the right direct, in the direction that is for the betterment of the planet, the betterment of nature, and more important, most importantly, the betterment of humanity. So, yeah, well, I would just say, um, I agree, we have colossal issues on this planet. But I also think the moment you say, why can't they? you've made it more of a colossal problem because it's out of your hands. The Navajo always said, when you point a finger at someone, you better know that three fingers are pointing back at you. So, it's interesting, I have a daughter 15 years old and she goes to school in Spain and I see very clearly where the school is not doing its job. And that really, it motivates me to pick up the slack at home. I'm not gonna go up against a school. Like, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institution. Can't go up against that. But I would say, when we look at the problems, and we, I, I'm not saying people should not be held accountable. It's not what I'm saying. 
there are extremely irresponsible, indiv individualistic, oriented groups that care nothing about the community. And I'm not saying we should not hold them responsible. But I am saying we need to hold ourselves three times responsible. So in answer to your question, I don't think you can go up against the big colossal problems of this planet. However, to really own that would be to fix whatever colossal problem you might have going on inside of you. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pointing you out as an example. I'm just saying that we need to work this out. Otherwise, we don't, need, we don't even know how to work out the other stuff. We're just like all of them. So the problem I feel in the end always comes down to this. All right, well, I think we're wrapped. Thank you. Thanks very much.